Let's start here. Ephesians 3, 14 through 19 reminds us uh, as Mercy Village Church that when we measure church growth, like this is like a cautionary statement for us, that we prioritize true spiritual depth before broad influential width. So instead of growing wide and, and having, you know, our goal be to, to become a large church with all sorts of, of programs, and we're not against any of that stuff, and, and maybe by God's grace one day we'll be that, but that's not what leads us. What leads us is the priority of true spiritual depth. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of His glory, flows out of Him, He may grant you to be strengthened with the power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And this is our hope for the people of Mercy Village Church. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth of the length, the height, and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all fullness of God. Let's pray. Father, might that be true of us? That before uh, there's any sort of maybe what the world would call successful measures of, uh, of um, us being a, a healthy church, that we would measure it by your standards. That we'd be people deeply rooted in your love, that that would spill out of that, that would spill into our hearts from you and spill out of our hearts through our hands and our feet and our voices uh, to others, Um, that we would be uh, truly recognizing even this morning, not just intellectually, but also emotionally and spiritually, the height and the depth of your love for us. May that be. Um, your gift to us today through your grace. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Will you stand with us? We're going to start today by being reminded that we are saved by Jesus to walk with Jesus together in worship toward our neighbor and to the ends of the earth throughout generations for all our days. So we're going to begin our service by lifting our voices together and singing. Uh, We're going to sing this first song, which is probably new to most of us. Uh, We're going to learn this together. And then we have a couple familiar Christmas carols that we're going to sing. We're going to lift our voices together and be reminded of who Jesus is and what he has done for us. The promises that he's made and that he's kept throughout all generations. And we can sing these Christmas carols and be reminded of that. And pray that the Holy Spirit will stir in us affections for our God and Savior as we sing.
Psalm 32 says, I acknowledged my sin to you. I confessed and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. So no matter how we come in here today, Jesus offers forgiveness. He alone can save. and He loves us. If you're in Christ today, he loved you knowing you, knowing our sins, our weaknesses. He died for our sins. He took our sins upon him and he has given us his righteousness. And it's a free gift available today. Let's continue singing this old hymn together. to dwell and she 
about these words. He's the son of righteousness. Hail the head, born prince of peace. Hail the son of righteousness. Light and life to all he brings. Risen with healing in his wings. Father, thank you today that we can come before you and be reminded of who you are and who Jesus is. We believe today that Jesus is alive and that one day we will be like him, that he came to set us free. That song said, born to give them second birth. That's us, God. And so we look forward to that day uh, with hope. And so just teach us today as your word is, is preached that you will reveal truth to us and help us to understand more of who you are today. In your name we pray. Amen. Kids are dismissed. If they want to go to their classes, they'll be just on a, a, a different level encountering the exact same gospel that we are encountering in here. So it's just... Uh, just put on a different, different level for their understanding and, and uh, taking it into their hearts. They're not being babysat back there. Just, uh, I think that's important that we, we know that we are trying to center everything we do here um, around the gospel. So I'm going to read a section of our uh, passage today, and then it has, be- has become our tradition. We'll, we'll read together these words um, on the screen that remind us of the value of, of God's Word. These are the words of, of Ruth in Ruth chapter 2, uh, verses 16 and 17. And Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. When we, uh, my bride and I were married, um, she, I didn't get my wedding ring till till the day of, as most men, it happens for us. She had a she had a ring that she got to hang on to for a while before we got married, but I didn't get mine till the wedding day. But inside, she'd uh, engraved. I guess she didn't do it, but she'd had engraved with a laser the words "I will follow you." Those words come from the passage that we're encountering today. Now she didn't know what she was getting herself into when she said that when she made that promise, but it was a commitment to loyal love. A commitment that through the ups and the downs has proven to to be true. And I could not be any more thankful than to have her stand with me. But those words 
began or originated from another woman. And then, as we'll find out, they are only spilled out of Ruth's mouth because of her God. Those words of loyal commitment. So as we continue our Advent series today, as we as we continue in the book of, of Ruth, what we'll see from Ruth's example in the midst of time for Naomi where she is struggling, and, and, and reasonably so, we're going to see that when hurting people isolate, when hurting people tend to pull back and withdraw themselves, and apathetic people don't care, that loyal love leans in. And that happens because of the love of Jesus. We're going to see that play out in in Ruth's life. So, Father, today what we know not, please teach us. What we are not, please make us. And what we have not, please please give us. That has to be true for me as uh, as the preacher today. I, I have nothing apart from you. I am nothing apart from you. I know nothing apart from you. So may that be true for me and true for us. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Remember the context, right? So we went through the first five verses last week of the book of Ruth. And, and Ruth and Naomi and Orpah, but in particular Naomi, have been put through the ringer. Uh, they had gone to Moab, Naomi and, and Elimelech, her husband, and her two boys, Milan and Chilion, had gone to escape a famine. But while they were there, Elimelech, if you remember verse 3, Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died. And she was left with her two sons. And those two sons took Moabite wives. And the name of one was Orpah. And the name of the other, Ruth. I do wonder like, if Orpah had been the, the one that had followed through and done all of the things that are celebrated for Ruth. Would that now be the more popular name, right? You, would there be more Orpahs than Ruths? That's just a little curiosity I've had. I think of only the biggest questions, the most important, the most important ones. They lived there about ten years. And both Milan and Chilion died. So that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Three verses. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. Kind of glaze over them in the intro of the book if, if you're not careful. But it was a wrecking ball. I mean, beyond what the vast majority of us can, can fathom. That level of loss. All of us in this room, no doubt, have experienced loss. But loss like that is at a very high level, and maybe some of us have, but, but many of us have not at that degree. And it was into that pain, that was the context, that loss beyond words, both for Naomi and for Orpah and Ruth, that now comes uh, the context of this week. And the next two verses add to the context of where uh, Naomi and Ruth and Orpah find themselves. It says, Then she arose with her daughters, this is Naomi, uh, with her daughters-in-law, to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited His people and given them food. So the, the rumor mill in Naomi's day was, I guess, in the, in the fields. And so she hears word that back in Bethlehem in Judah, there's food again. The famine is, is gone. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law. And they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. Two pieces of the context there. One's incredibly obvious. There's food again in Bethlehem. So there'd been a famine. Now there's, there's food. So she's set now to, to go back to a place where, where she's from, her hometown. But another thing that you'll see kind of not really between the lines. I mean, it's pretty explicit there, but, it, but it's not as explicit as the food piece, is that they were together. These three ladies were together. I, I said last week that these, that these women, especially Naomi and Ruth, and, and there's kind of three main characters in, in the book of Ruth, but the primary, primary characters are Ruth and Naomi. Their love for each other, their leadership of one another, their uh, words to one another, their lifting up of one another. They are uh, they display this this great relationship. Orpah was in on that too. She was part of that. They had suffered together. They had stood by gravesides together. They had rebuilt their lives at at different periods of, of great loss together. They 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 loved each other deeply and and that's proven by the fact that through all this cuz they didn't just like 
you don't just move back after a, ten years plus somewhere to another place without like having to get some affairs in order. So through that whole process of time, like whatever it took, if they had to to put their home, you know, rent it some, uh, if it was rented or it was owned or you know however that looked for them, that property had to be taken care of. Their their goods had to be packed up that they were going to take with them, and whatever they weren't taking with them was sold or whatever that process looked like for them through that whole time they were together in this as they pack up and get on the road to travel back to Bethlehem they are still together in this so there was an intimacy there for Orpah and Ruth and Naomi they didn't have anybody else really but they had each other that deep bond that they had they had they'd been in the trenches together they would bled together They'd wept together. They'd laughed and enjoyed life together. What I want us to see today, almost above everything else in the sense of from human standpoint, obviously I want us to see Jesus and his answer to it, but, but Naomi's pain, her desire to isolate herself for reasons that I think all of us can can at some level begin to understand. Because something flips in verse 8. But I guarantee you it's something that had been churning in her heart and her soul this whole time as they pack up to leave. Something she's been mauling over and and wrestling with. Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. I want to camp out here for a second because I want us to meet Naomi where she was. You see, this is a a de-invitation of sorts. It has been assumed that her daughters are going to go with her, but now she says, no, don't, don't come with me. But why? Like, what is that rooted in? What are the reasons for Naomi's heart being in the place that she is? She urges them to return. She blesses them for their kindness. But there's three kind of things that will flesh out in these coming verses that are introduced right here, right now. The first is that something's going on in her heart. Something that all of us, I think, can relate to at some level. Maybe not uniquely in her circumstances, but in a general way. There's something in her, her soul that is, is, is churning. And so she's cutting them off at some level. Is it for their good, perhaps? Is it for other reasons? We're going to dig into that. Uh, number two, another thing we see here that you're also going to see play out is this Hebrew word, uh, and, and all the, the Hebrew scholars that eventually will attend our church are just going to laugh at me, but, but hesed is the is the Hebrew word, and we're going to see that word exemplified in verses 16 through 18. This is a huge, huge piece of not just today's uh, verses, but the entire book. We'll come back to that as well. But Ruth and Orpah both dealt that way, hesed, towards Naomi and her loss. And then the last thing is something that was introduced to us last week, and it goes through the whole book as well. The, the, the sermon subtitle is Surely God is With Us. Remember last week we talked about how God's, the doctrine of God is only really described twice. Doctrine about God is only described kind of twice in, in explicit language in the entire book of Ruth. And the rest of the mentions of God's name are just kind of in passing part of the dialogue. He's, he's, he's strangely absent. There's not like poems about him. There's not doctrinal statements or theological statements about him. There's not these big descriptors about who he is that you find in so many other places in the in the Bible. He's with them in the ordinary, the day by day life that we we really got into that last week. In the regular ordinary rhythms, he is there, but he's there. She invokes his name as part of her blessing. When she blesses uh, her her two daughters in law. So the blessing's beautiful, but the fact remains she's kind of saying, hey, leave me. She kind of pushes them 
out of the nest, if you will, and says, stay here. What had been assumed to be a togetherness and intimacy that would continue on now gets this cut off, but they will have no part of it at first. And they said to her, no, we will return with you to your people. Now, some scholars say that that was just, you know, maybe a cultural uh, thing to do, right? Like when someone says, here, let me pay for this meal. And you say, no, 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 (laughs) you can't pay for the meal. Right. But you really know you're going to let them pay for the meal, but you kind of have to refuse it. Right. That's the custom. And there may have been a piece of that here in that, that that it just was the respectful thing to do. But I don't I think the vast majority of this was that deep bond that they had. They did not want to be parted. Naomi. But Naomi is in a place. She's in a place right now. And so she pushes back yet again. Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I sons in my womb that that may become your husbands? Now, in in Jewish uh, law and in uh, Jewish tradition, if a woman's husband died, she was widowed. The primary and first responsibility would then fall to the family, in particular, the next brother in line to to care for her. So that would have been what she's thinking. She's like, are there going to be other boys that I'm going to have that will then, you know, take up that that uh, requirement to care for you? Turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons nine months from now, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Well, you might feel like you're married to babies, but uh, but you're actually not. They got to grow up. Would you therefore refrain uh, refrain from marrying like now, like you could find another spouse now? Would you refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. There's a lot that just happened there. I want us to pause and kind of get underneath where Naomi is. One of the things I love about Scripture in different places is that it as as especially in narratives like this, the underlying motives of people aren't necessarily always explicitly revealed to us. The underlying feelings, emotions, battles and struggles that are internal to Naomi are not explicitly Born out to us. But what's beautiful about that is we can pick out some of these clues of what's going on in her life. And it may be all of them or it may be some of them, but at least there's things in there that we are going to be able to relate to as we see here. Why is she pushing them out? Why is she so adamant that they leave her? Is it her shame? She talks about her shame. She doesn't have a husband. She's too old to have children. These markers upon her her life of uh, of shame. Does she feel unworthy? Like, is she going to isolate herself because she's not worthy? Right. Like you spend your life with me, Ruth and Orpa. It's a waste of your time because I'm not worthy of your love. Could it be that? I mean, I know that we do things like that. That we will isolate ourselves because of shame. That we'll pull back from community. That we'll push others away because of our shame. I will. I don't want to speak for y'all, but I will. Are there things in your life that make you feel unworthy? Maybe past sins, past struggles, past experiences that make you feel shame? And now you think, what do I have to offer? I'm just dragging everybody around me down with my unworthiness and my uselessness. That may have been at play. For Naomi, what about guilt? There's this thing in her language, the way she talks, that she actually feels like God is punishing her for something. There's a lot of clues that would say that Naomi thinks God is punishing her for something. Some of us struggle with with guilt. There was no written law against them going to Moab. But Appalachian Christians will understand all those unwritten laws, right? Like for some of you, right, like I'm going to do something right now that maybe drive you crazy, right? You grew up in a home where you could put your glass of water on your Bible. That's sacrilege, right? But show me chapter and verse. I haven't seen it. But you carry guilt 
right? That's a silly example. But you carry guilt with you over things that aren't found in here, but have been leveled upon you by the community or family or people that you've, you've been brought up with. Maybe as they left Bethlehem, they were chided, deserters. Why are you leaving us in this time of famine? You can't stick it out like the rest of us? And maybe she's carrying that guilt and that shame. You feel like you can't be happy because of your sins. That you have to punish yourself. You have to feel pain inflicting you. Maybe self-destruction is a tendency that comes to you because of your guilt. There's another thing that I think may be happening here too, and I'm not pointing a finger at Naomi, I'm pointing it at myself. We value things that are yet to come over things that currently are. What they had was special. Now, I get that they needed husbands economically. There was like, it was a different culture back then. There weren't a whole lot of single ladies, all the women independent, making it happen in those cultures because of the way that they were structured. It just wasn't normal. The, mo- the women who were most secure were those who were either still in their father's home or those who had a, a husband, a spouse, to, to care for them. But they'd survived a lot. They'd managed, and what they had was incredibly special, but instead of recognizing the value of that, Naomi is, is saying what's best for you is husbands. Again, I'm not chiding her, but I'm looking at my own heart that I oftentimes look at what's yet to come, that's what will make me happy. That's when I'll be satisfied is when this new thing or this thing finally develops in my my life. You'll always struggle to be be satisfied with your circumstances when uh, when the value of what currently is holds less weight than the value of what's yet to come. If you're always waiting for what's yet to come, then once you get that, that'll be what you currently have. And you'll still be valuing more highly what's yet to come. It's another thing here, too, though, that motivates Naomi. It's genuine care. She cares for her daughters. in law She wants them to be taken care of. She wants them to be provided for. But laced in that, as with all of us, is some doubt that God can do that in Bethlehem. God can't provide husbands for them in Bethlehem and and humorously, God's going to kind of say, watch this, in the life of Ruth. He's going to provide her a husband in Bethlehem. Now, we don't know the rest of Orpah's story. I pray that she found a husband in Moab as well. But but we know for sure that the one who definitely found a husband found her husband in Bethlehem. Sometimes our doubts can lead us to to isolate for, for reasons that appear good on the surface. Kind of push others away from us thinking that that's how we're going to care for them. God can't provide for these people around me while they're in proximity to me. And so we kind of push them away. We pull back from them. I think it may be a combo of all four things that are that are causing her to isolate herself. Here's something I see in myself and in Naomi here. She doesn't see her worth. In this moment, in the midst of her pain and in the midst of her struggle and in the midst of her hurting and not just hurting for herself, but hurting for her daughters in law, she doesn't see her worth. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, uh, she's worth you're worth it type of, you know, bad theology that that you have some intrinsic value inside and you pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and you make yourself worth it. I'm talking about the dignity and honor that comes to all of humanity because we bear the image of God. That's a two way street, by the way, we're called to protect life and defend the weak and the vulnerable because they have inherent dignity that comes because they bear the image of God. But it also is in how we see ourselves. Our own identity, you can't just love your neighbor, right, and see them as bearing the image of God and not see that you yourself also bear the image of God. Sometimes in our pain and in our struggles and in our hurting and in the suffering of life, we forget that we bear the image of God. And Naomi desperately needs someone to step into her life right now and remind her, right, because of God, 
Not because of yourself, Naomi, but because of God, you are worth being with. You are worth staying with. You are worth clinging to. She doesn't know how desperately she needs that. We oftentimes don't know how desperately we need that. We tend to think that we'll be a drag on the people around us because of our sin and our brokenness and our and our hurting. And so when people try to step in and to help us, we oftentimes will kind of push away. Some of us have self-destructive tendencies when things are going too well, we kind of will self-destruct what's what's happening. Some of us have a mindset, I'm unworthy of blank. So that never happens in our lives because we just we're not worthy of it. People get divorced sometimes because they hate each other. But sometimes spouses will leave their other spouse because they just don't think they want their spouse to have to put up with the train wreck that they are. I've sat in those counseling rooms. People said, I'm leaving not because I hate this person, but because I don't want them to have to put up with me. They don't see the worthiness of themselves there. Suicidal ideations rooted in the belief that you're a burden to the world. That's real. I must atone for something. I must uh, forgiveness isn't for me on a more like basic level. Like there's there's some of us. We don't Sabbath. We don't rest because we don't think we've earned it. Right. Like we're like Naomi. Naomi's like Ruth and and Orpah. Like we want to come with you. We want to be with you. And she's like, I'm not worthy of that. There's too much shame. There's too much guilt. You won't get the 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 expectations that that I think you should have for yourself with me. So she pushes back. She has doubts that God can provide those things. And in all of that. She pushes back. And Orpah buys in at some level. Now, Orpah's never condemned, by the way, in this, in this passage, in this book. She goes on her way. They lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Ruth stays. She hangs on. Uh, the de-invitation is repeated one more time. She said, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return to your uh, return after your sister-in-law. She tells her to go one more time. And and Ruth refuses with those words that we. That we read at the very beginning. God loves Naomi. More deeply than she can feel or comprehend in that moment. God sees her worthiness. God sees her beauty. God sees her dignity. And God places someone in her life, Ruth, who will display that steadfast, loyal, loving kindness. And it's Ruth. Ruth says these words, right? It, into the guilt and shame and skewed expectations and doubt that may have been exp- churning and, and spinning around in Naomi's heart. She says, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you for where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death parts me from you. What this is, is this concept of hesed. If you go back to the description of God, in Exodus 34, 6, you will hear him describe himself. The Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, hesed and faithfulness. This word appears over and over and over again in the Old Testament. This word is the very character of God, his love, his generosity, his enduring commitment. And Ruth displays it because Hesed is not just love, but it is love. Deep personal care that clings to those who are loved. Ruth clings to Naomi. She leans in with presence over presence, right? Like, that's cute. But she's not looking at, like, what, Ruth's not saying, what can I give 
physically beyond just being with her. I am with you, Naomi. She clings to her. Hesed is generosity. It's self-sacrifice. Notice Ruth changes all of her mys to yours. I'm going to turn away from my people and then I will cling to your people. Turn away from my gods and cling to your God. She's self-sacrificing in her love. She's generous in her love. She leans in with selflessness instead of selfishness. Hesed is generosity. Hesed is enduring commitment. She says she'll go to the grave till death alone separates us. It's steadfast and enduring. It leans in with, with perseverance, not preservation. She's not seeking her own good. She She's seeking it, the good of Naomi. Hesed is the very character of God. And it spills down into, has spilled down into Ruth and now spills out to Naomi. And Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her and she, she says no more. Now the last part of the story. Because you see, God was loving Naomi here through Ruth, in ways that she deeply needed. The, the loyal love of Ruth is God's gift to Naomi, and she's going to need it. Because not only in her pain is she going to need that loyal love, but her community is going to be apathetic to her pain. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem, about anywhere from 40 to 90 miles. They make this journey. And when they come to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? And she said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? A couple things here. Still see her ongoing pain. That's obvious. We've talked about that. She's still struggling with that. She, she has been dealt bitterly with. She's in pain. We've looked at those underlying potential, underlying reasons for her pain. But notice one more thing. She's holding God responsible for her pain. She said it is His hand that has come against her. This is a mixture of good and bad theology. This isn't completely right. Like, like you can hear some undertones in what she's saying that may not be true of God. Is God sovereign over all things? 100% yes. Does God sometimes send suffering and pain? Yes, sometimes He does. Is God always capable of staving off suffering and pain if He so desires? Yes, 100%. He is sovereign. There is no shortage of His power. There is no shortage of His ability. But not every pain that is in our lives is this kind of direct, like, you know, slamming down of the fist of God upon his people. And just because there's suffering in your life does not mean that it's punishment for sin. Naomi, quite frankly, doesn't know if that's true or not. So there's some there's some twisted theology there and her identity follows her theology when you come to know who God is and how God looks at you and, and how God looks at others, your identity will follow in tow. And so she's wrapped up in, in, in the pain and hopelessness of her, of her life. She wants to even change her name and her identity. But what's even more striking, and this is where we close, is the apathy of her community. Quite frankly, what we're going to see is that they're going to have to go out and fend for themselves. And there's a man named Boaz that's going to take some measures that were expected within the, the law that will be helpful to them. But that community that stirred up, the rabble that comes to welcome her back and hear her little speech are strangely absent from the rest of the book of Ruth until they come to, to, to Peanut Gallery comment one more time later on in the book. They're not there for her. They don't come and rise to the occasion. They're apathetic in, in many ways towards her. Stirred for the juicy gossip. You sure look old, Naomi. You know, like those kinds of things, right? Looks like you lived hard, Naomi, right? And then they go back to their house and do their own thing. 
May that never be true for us. They were called to something greater in this book, in the Torah. They were called to something more than that, not just for Naomi, but also for Ruth, a foreigner in their midst. May that never be true of us. Might we be a welcoming church for the Naomi's in our midst, which next week could be any of us, quite frankly. And maybe we'd be welcoming to the Naomi's that have yet to come through our doors. That we'll take our cues for how to love people from, not from the community around us, but from the Lord. The covenant community is apathetic towards Naomi, but there's still hope in that, the final verse. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem, and it was at the beginning of barley harvest. If you'd never read the story before, then that may not sound like hope. But if you've read the story before, you know that that barley harvest, it is there that God is going to most explicitly enter the story. Most vividly show up on behalf of Naomi and Ruth. There's hope for us too. Sometimes we are Naomi. We're in pain. Maybe shame or guilt or doubt or skewed expectations or any other number of reasons. And not only that, but life experiences have beat us down and we find ourselves where she's at. There's hope for us there. Sometimes we're the community. We find ourselves dealing apathetically with those who are hurting and in pain. There's hope for us there. Too, and that hope is, is a person. What Naomi needed was hesed. She needed a unconditional expression of loyal love. That's what she needed. That's what Ruth is going to need too. That's what every single one of us need today. And the incarnation is the evidence of that. See, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted, okay? Those in pain like Naomi. But even more so than Ruth, like Ruth sets that example. She comes close to the brokenhearted. She brings that loyal love to Naomi who is hurting. But you know what else is great about our God? Is He comes to the apathetic community with that same love. That whether you're in a season of pain or you're in a season of apathy, Jesus meets you there with His steadfast, loyal love. Love that doesn't fail. And the incarnation is proof that God's loyal love never fails. You see, we'll mess this up. We will. I'm not being harsh. I'm just being real. We'll mess this up. We'll be like Naomi when people and God are trying to like show their loyal love to us and we'll push back and we'll cut off. And we'll be like the community. We'll be apathetic. But God never fails. His love is is forever. In in Psalm 136, 26 times that word hesed appears. It's forever. His loyal love never fails. And this is love. Not that we loved God. Not that we had it right. Not that we were experts at, at this but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. That is the message of the Incarnation. That in the midst of the hurting and pain of Naomi and in the midst of the apathy of the community and in the midst of what would have been a struggle for Ruth too. You know, Naomi doesn't even mention her when she comes back. I forgot to say that. Like like Naomi's like, I left full and I've come back empty. But there's somebody right next to her when she says that. Somebody who just gave up everything to be with her. She doesn't even mention her. Like, that's way worse. Like, how many times have you forgot to introduce your spouse? Like, when you're meeting somebody, right? Like, this is infinitely beyond that. Insulting at some level. Ruth needs the loyal love of God to be real to her. In those moments, too, we all... Need that, and that's the the message of Advent. 
that Jesus, right, Billy Graham, never thought I'd quote Billy Graham, the very purpose of Christ coming into the world was that He might offer up His life as a sacrifice for the sins of men. He came to die. This is the heart of Christmas. That Jesus came to give His life up out of loyal love, sacrifice, so that we might have eternal life. Trust Jesus today if you're not a Christian. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And if you are a Christian... Three things. The two of them are just information, but it's information not for your head, it's for your soul. In your apathy to others, God's love for you, child of God, doesn't fail. You have to know that today. If you're beating yourself up for being apathetic to the needs of others, God's love for you doesn't fail. That doesn't mean you don't need to get better and that He's not going to empower you to do so, but He loves you. He loves you as, there's nothing you can do to make him love you less. There's nothing you can do to make him love you more. He loves you there and his love doesn't fail. And in your pain, your guilt, your shame, your skewed expectations, your feelings of unworthiness, child of God, he loves you unconditionally. That's not for your head, it's for your heart. I can't put it there. But I've asked the Holy Spirit all week to. Put it there for you, wherever it is that you need it. You're loved. Right? Like, like Ruth clinged to Naomi. God clings to you. You're at, right? What's well, that scripture that, that you're in the palm of Jesus' hand and God's hand and nothing can pluck you out? He loves you. So three, might we take our cues from Jesus and not the world? And here's what I mean by that. Might we experience loyal love? Might we know it? Feel it. See it. Know the loyal love of God. Taste and see that the Lord is good, abounding in steadfast love. That means you've got to show up here. I'm preaching to the choir. Not this specific place, but somewhere where the gospel is being preached. You need to show up uh, in community with other believers. You need to be reading the word. That's how we taste. It's like a meal. You're coming to eat. Taste and see that the Lord is, is good. And might our identity follow that theology? My wife and I in this season, praying every night for the last three nights, just out of our desperate need to feel the presence of God. Just be real vulnerable with you. We lay there at night and pray, God, increase our unbelief. Might we feel your presence and know your promises because we just don't feel it. Might we know the loyal love of God. Might we receive the loyal love of others that God has placed in our lives to give it to us? Naomi finally does. Might we receive it as well? And then might we embody it? Might we have loyal love to God and loyal love to others? Love God. Love others. God made you for this. Cling to Him. Follow Him. Where He goes, go. Make his places your places, his people your people, his ways your ways to the to the death. We love God, love others. When hurting people isolate and apathetic people don't care, loyal love leans in. That's exactly what Jesus did for us. He leaned into our pain, he leaned into our hurting, he leaned into our suffering. And he clings to us today, the true children of God. Father, I I feel like in my soul, so many things from this passage. And what's hard about being a preacher is like coming to the end of talking and feeling like, man, I didn't do that justice. I just didn't. Humanly speaking, I didn't do that justice. But it's been about the Holy Spirit the whole time. It's been about the power of your word the whole time, not my ability to communicate or not communicate. And so I pray that you will have taken your message today. And you will have opened the eyes of your people today. And you will have met them where they are in their time of, of need or whatever, they, wherever they find themselves with the truth of the gospel. And you will do what I can't do. You will heal hurting people and you will awaken apathetic people and you will um, make us fully aware of your love for us. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.
We're going to move into a time of communion today. Uh, if you're new with us, we do this every week as a reminder of, of what Jesus has done for us and to take a moment to reflect, uh, to repent of any sin, and uh, we do this together as family. Uh, today we're reading from Luke 22. He recounts the story, and when the hour came, he reclined at table, and the apostles with him, him being Jesus. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves, for I tell you, from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. So we have... uh, crackers and juice at each side we're going to take some time play a song uh and we're reminded that uh christ's body was broken for us and christ's blood was shed for us and so we do that today as family if you're not a believer just observe or trust christ today and take communion with us father as your people continue to partake these symbols and realities of your presence. Pray that you will meet them where they are. That you will do for them what you did for Naomi through Ruth. What you did through uh, did for Ruth through yourself and what you'll do for Ruth through through Boaz and what you did through Boaz, great grandma and Rahab and on and on the list could go. The same grace and goodness and and salvation would would be known and felt by your people today. Amen. This is the Mercy Village mantra, and it's super encouraging on the front end. My sin runs deep, but uh, God's grace runs deeper still in Christ alone. Anyone can get on this, so we're going to say this together, and then we'll be dismissed. But first, there's been a Christmas miracle I have to share with you. The dumpster is absolutely empty right now. That's behind this building. Uh, those of you that helped with renovations, you know how exciting that is. Um, those of you who know what I'm about to ask know how exciting that's not. Um, if you if you have a chance, there's a bunch of garbage on this back stairwell here. If you are a, a member of Mercy Village Church, if you're a guest, please don't make me. F- I'll be like I'll be like Naomi. If you try to help, I'll be like, no, don't help. Stop. You know, don't create that awkwardness for me. But if you're a member of Mercy Village and you can help. Take that trash down to the dumpster. Uh, we're going to fill it up. Anything that's wood or brick, don't take. But everything else can go down to that dumpster. Got it? <laughs> about three people that I think are in, which is enough, I promise. Okay, let's say this together and we can be dismissed. My sin runs deep. God's grace runs deeper still. In Christ alone, anyone can get in on this. You're dismissed.